I'm delighted to be here and I really want to thank the Hartford Healthcare and the Office of Human Research Protections for inviting me out. Um, one of the things that Sherry didn't tell you is that, <laughs> no, it's really okay, it was in a, another life. I was at San Diego State University for close to 15 years, um, was hired by them to help them develop their human research protection program. And so I started, I think I was affiliated with Primer back in 1995, um, and really have, I've been an IRB member for the past, gosh, 20 years now. So I have that side of my life going on, and concurrently with being in research administration, I was the director of research affairs at San Diego State, and that included having oversight of the Human Research Protection Program, among other things. But I got really involved in wanting to study research ethics and was fortunate to get funding to do that. Um, so concurrent with my administration position, I started to create an active research program. And about three years ago, I migrated from San Diego State over to UC San Diego. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that journey and what kind of things have kind of serendipitous in, in many ways have led me to where I am today. So because this happens, every, I have to give a disclosure about where I'm funded from. So I have two main projects that Sherry mentioned. One of them is, is the Building Research Integrity and Capacity Program that I'll talk about during the second part of my talk. And then the Connected and Open Research Ethics, which is a really important part of what we're doing today that um, is creating a community where we can all come together and, and start talking about research with emerging technologies or what we call mobile health or digital health. So I'm funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation presently and our funding with the Office of Research Integrity and National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health have helped support the, the building research integrity and capacity programs. So the title of my talk today is Shaping Research Ethics in the Digital Age. What I'd like to do is, is really focus on how research is changing and what, what the past 15 years, 16 years of, of the 2000s have brought into the picture about how research is conducted. What are the key challenges of using emerging technologies in research today? Who are the stakeholders in how are we making decisions about shaping the ethics of, of the research that we see? And what are the options for increasing community capacity so that our participants can be actual and authentic informed participants and partners? So the research of today is much more complex than I would say it was 20 years ago when I first got involved in human research protections. Um, the behavioral scientists and the social scientists that I'm working with are looking, and, and you know, honestly, biomedical research across the board is involving clinical research as well as biomedical, behavioral, and social, and they're starting to get integrated. So people are looking at, at health from so many different angles. We're looking at our social networks, our health behaviors. We're looking at the microbiome now, the genome, the environment. And how we go about measuring those influences on health have changed. So about three years ago, my colleagues in behavioral medicine asked me if I could help them navigate the IRB, that they had an R01 from NIH that involved mobile imaging, pervasive sensing, social media, and location tracking technologies. So we created this acronym that I call MIST, and you're seeing more of this now in your everyday research. I, I'm, I'm fairly certain you're starting to see this, where people are using <laughs> cell phones to collect personal health data in real time. So it's raising new challenges for how does that data get transmitted, how do we protect it, how is it secured. The imaging technologies are wearable cameras that are being used to see what people do in real time in their day-to-day -day life without having to rely on self-report or bringing somebody into a laboratory to watch how they behave. So now these technologies can be used to see how people act in their everyday, everyday. 
And all of this is going to lead to the ability to be very prescriptive about how we treat and prevent disease. How many of you in here have heard of, of the Precision Medicine Initiative? Okay, that looks like maybe about 30%. So I'll talk a little bit about that while I'm, while I'm here as well. So the characteristics of 21st century research is we are living in a smart and connected environment, an increasingly smart and connected environment, where we can monitor participants in real time, 24-7. It's not exclusively an academic adventure anymore. So we have now Apple Research Kit. We have Google, who has a company called Verily that's involved in health research, Microsoft Research. We have nonprofits getting involved in research. Um, it's a different, different kind of landscape. And the things that we know now, we cannot guarantee that we can protect people's anonymity any longer. So these are the kind of things that are happening with this new kind of technology. So this is the, this is the case that got me started um, on this path, is when my colleague said, we can't get our studies approved to tell us what we need to do. Knowing that I was on the IRB and also in their department, I went and sat with them and sat in their lab, and I said, so what are you doing? And they said, well, we want to see what people do in their everyday life. And so we've recruited people. We want to recruit people from Craigslist. We want to have them wear different kinds of sensors so we can see what they're doing. So this case, Brittany is one of the research assistants, and she's wearing a camera around her neck. So it's an outwardly facing camera. Um, she has around her hip an accelerometer and a GPS device that's keeping track of where she is when she's active. She also has accelerometers on both wrists so that they can look to see whether or not accelerometers that are worn on the wrist are measuring things differently than an accelerometer worn on the hip. And I've mentioned this before at, at a primer meeting, and this is one of the things that they learned is that when you are riding a bike, the accelerometer thinks you're sitting down. So it's not accurately measuring movement and activity. So this, is, this was a study to see whether or not these devices could objectively measure everyday behavior so that they didn't have to rely on self-report. So you can kind of see, where, and this is an observation study. They just wanted to see, would this work? But the IRB had a problem with it. And the problem had to do with the wearable camera. I'll just ask you real quick. So has anybody noticed that I'm wearing a wearable camera? How many of you in here would have wanted me to disclose that before I started talking? So there's some consent concerns, right? So you guys, I'm the human subject, let's just say. I'm, this, I'm the participant in the research, and I've agreed to wear this. You can't really tell that it's a camera, can you? And it doesn't make noise when it takes pictures, but it's telling the researcher an awful lot about that person and how they move through their life, where they are when they're active, what it looks like, and you happen to be the byproduct or bycatch. So under what circumstances should you have the right to consent to be in my research record? So this is a new kind of challenge. It's not one that's insurmountable. It's something that we can deal with. But it was a challenge at the time that it went through the IRB and it caused delays. So these are the delays that happen when things are introduced to us as IRB people that are not familiar and also the reason that things take a long time. And one of the reasons that I received funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is that they have so many concerns about new technologies being used in research and their grantees cannot get approval to start their work. So they said, if you could help us bridge that gap, we need, we need solutions. We don't, you know, we know that these things are new and different. Let's figure out how to help IRBs so that they can work better with these kind of technologies. So there were, this is not on, by the way. I'm not taking anybody's picture. This is just a prop so you can kind of get a sense of what, what kind of things we're talking about and thinking about. So you're here in a public room. What if I was coming to your house for dinner? What if I'm going to work? What if I'm in a meeting? What if I'm going to the clinic? So there's all these different places where there's different kinds of considerations that we need to think about.
but we also need to think about them and be consistent so that we don't create inconsistency across all the IRBs that are st starting to struggle with how do we do this. So social media is also introducing a lot of new opportunities for health research. So RunKeeper has tons of data that researchers are using to learn about how people are active or inactive. We have all kinds of uh, opportunities through Amazon, through Twitter, Facebook. So people are using Facebook and Twitter not only to recruit participants, but to actually conduct interventions. And they can also analyze this kind of data, which, you know, much of it is public data and available to any one of us. We can download data right now from Twitter and it's geotagged, and we can start figuring out what people are doing. I just uh, gave Dr. Pritchard an article that my co-investigator wrote that identifies, he can identify HIV hotspots based on people's tweets. So this could be really important health information, but it's also really important that we think about what's private, what isn't, and how do we handle that kind of information, because most of the people that are tweeting aren't thinking about these things when they set their settings. They kind of go on this autopilot and don't realize that this data is public. So, or maybe they do. We, we really don't know the answers to this. This is a sensor that a colleague of mine in bioengineering has created. This is about the size, a little bit bigger than a postage stamp. It's sitting on somebody's skin right now, so that's skin. And it, you can see it has an uh, E ECG sensor, it has temperature sensors, it has a wireless power core coil, it does EEG, photo detectors, wireless antenna, wireless communication. He's using this to monitor fetal heart rate and contractions remotely so that they can let the mom know when she actually needs to come to the hospital instead of having somebody come to the hospital and be sent home and back and forth or being stuck in a bed with, with the big belt and, and having only that as an option for monitoring health behavior. So, so there's a lot of really interesting new things. These commercial products that we've seen over the past three years, these didn't exist when I first started down this pathway. So Fitbit didn't exist. And now we have all of these commercial products that are being used as research tools. How many of you in here have looked at a study that involves the Fitbit device? Whoa, okay, there's a lot of you in here. So there's new, new challenges that are introduced when we're using commercial products as research tools because there's a terms and conditions document that has to be agreed to in order to participate in the studies. Fitbit has a workaround, so you don't actually have to accept the terms and conditions, but those are new kinds of things that actually con conflict with the federal regulations. So new things to think about with the commercial products. This is just an example of the different kind of data that's collected. So in the GPS, you can see somebody that's been traveling up and down across the California-Mexico border. Um, you can see a, a, an example of an image that the camera takes. This is a person that's in an office building, so you can see that that you know, it's kind of a, a fisheye lens. Social media data, just the volume and granularity. What's interesting about a lot of this data is it's not protected health information. It's not being collected as part of a patient's activity or being put in an electronic health record. But it is sensitive health information. So how do we store it? What are the standards? What should they be? So. The kind of questions we're asking and the things that we're interested in looking at are how do we obtain informed consent? How can we make sure that the people who are participating in the studies actually understand what kind of data is being collected about them? Do they understand what real time is? Do they understand what storing in the cloud means? We want to know about how to evaluate the probability and magnitude of harm so that we can help IRBs understand how to think about these things. We want to know what the rights of bystanders should be. We don't know a lot. We have a framework actually that we've just recently validated and published in translational behavioral medicine 
that gives some guidance on how you can think about bystanders who are captured by a camera and under what circumstances you can consent them, you know. And again, then you are actually putting more burden possibly on a research participant to have to be thinking about all of these things. And then data management, as I just mentioned, a lot of the data that we're collecting isn't covered by HIPAA. So under what circumstances should you have standards in place and know what those standards are? And all of this is happening at a time where the landscape is even getting more complicated. So we have the NPRM that's still kind of out there. We have the quantified self movement. How many of you in here have heard of the quantified self movement? Okay, just a handful. So this is a, these are citizen scientists. These are people that are capturing their own data and making sense of themselves, capturing all kinds of their own data. And they are a movement and are growing and they're, they're their own scientists. And so what do we do with that? Um, the Precision Medicine Initiative is starting up in January. Um, they've just released the name, I guess it was just last week, of, of the different centers who are going to be involved in capturing data, enrolling a million people, enrolling a million people that somebody may not have direct contact with during the consent process. So times are changing, and I think what we need to really pay attention to is that we need to change with the times and be nimble and be thoughtful, but how do we go about doing that? This just came out in the paper yesterday, and I just thought it would be interesting to, to add it. So Science 37 is, is a technology-enabled clinical research company that is planning to bring clinical trials to people's homes. So they are kind of reimagining what a clinical trial looks like, how people will have access to it, and I would love for you guys to go and look at their site. I just glanced at it, but it doesn't really, it, it sounds like a good thing. It could easily lead to this, um, what is that called, let me think. Um, oh, it'll come to me in a minute. Just the idea though, it, it's not real obvious that this is experimental. Therapeutic misconception. That's what I was thinking of. It's, it's not going to be real obvious to people that this isn't going to be something that helps them. So th these are the kind of things that I don't even know who Science 37 is, but it's a new way of doing business. So we really wanted to start looking at how do we make sense of what's going on. So one of the studies that we did, I call it the iWatch exit survey. So you saw Brittany all wired up with these different gadgets. They enrolled 280 some odd people in that study. By the time we decided to find out what those participants experienced, we were able to recruit 82 of them to complete an exit survey. And we asked them about their experiences. We asked them about whether or not the informed consent process and content reflected their experience. We asked them if they, you know, what their major complaints were, if any. We asked them about their preferences for privacy. We asked them about whether or not looking at the images, like they were allowed to look at the images that they captured on their camera. That's about 30,000 images. Um, we wanted to know whether or not that control over their data mattered. We wanted to know if the transparency was important to them. We also wanted to know if whether coaching them on how to respond to somebody who asked about the camera while they were wearing it was useful. So that's a paper that we just published in Translational Behavioral Medicine. And what we learned is that the informed consent process was exactly what they anticipated. Some people thought the images were blurrier than expected. Others thought they were more clear. People's interactions with them, some people said this is really creepy. Other people said that's really cool. You know, so Let me know if you want to see the paper, because I think it, it's really a good starting point for engaging participants in the process of assessing risk and not having us imagine it for them, because I worry about us overprotecting people and not giving them the option of getting into research studies that probably would be kind of fun and interesting for them. The participants really enjoyed their, their involvement in the study. What I found interesting is that they rated themselves as very, very private. 
I'm like, who does that while they're wearing a camera? So then we wanted to see about, um, we, in San Diego, it's a really diverse, culturally diverse community. We wanted to see whether or not that mattered, you know, whether people in diverse communities thought about these kind of technologies differently. And so we've done some like little small studies with the Latino population who worry about the GPS tracking, they worry about their legal status. Um, we talked with people in the native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community who again had concerns about being tracked passively. Um, we also went to the refugee Somali community in San Diego, and this was an interesting one because they had agreed to wear an accelerometer, which is not, you know, really a new device. It just, it's been around for a while, but it was something that the investigator asked them to wear it around their wrist. They were in a physical activity and nutrition study, and they explained it. They showed them pictures of it. They said, this is what it does. This is what the data looks like, and, and the women agreed to participate. And when the investigator went back to get the devices to download the data, there was no data. There was no data. And they did not wear their devices, even though they said, yeah, absolutely going to wear it, no problem. But they didn't wear it. So they didn't wear it because it was something that they had to wear around their wrist. It caused unwanted attention. It conflicted with their culture in that they pray five times a day and they have, have to wash their hands and so they had to take things off. He said, if you had just given us a waist worn, we would have worn it, no problem. But something happened in that translation and, and so these kind of things are important for us to be paying attention to and really engaging people in the process of designing these studies. I also was so fortunate to have Anthony Madgett involved. Um, He's one of our advisors on the core project. He's the director of the Human Research Protection Program at, at UC San Diego. And I told him I really want to understand how the IRBs are thinking about this. And we have five IRBs at UC San Diego. And so I, instead of asking the IRB if I could look at their records, I went to the investigators who were using these kind of technologies. And I said, can I see your protocols? and eight of the, of the investigators shared their entire protocol with me. So I could look at what they were doing, what they submitted to the IRB, what the IRB said back to them, what they said back to the IRB, how that, you know, the back and forth went. And in one institution with five IRBs, four different IRBs reviewed these studies and found different things to be concerned about, different ways of managing risks, different, sometimes completely ignoring things that another committee said absolutely not. So if we're seeing that in one institution, then let's multiply that by the 6,000 that are out in the U.S. and how do we stop this from moving forward in a chaotic way and think about how do we move it forward in a cohesive manner that where we communicate with each other. So the last piece of this is the ecosystem. What's happening? I'm seeing it at UC San Diego. Is it happening anywhere else? So we did a search through the NIH reporter using keywords that have come up and that our group kind of generated to find out what's happening in the mobile health ecosystem. Who's doing this kind of research? Who's funding this kind of research? Where is it happening? And so we've just, we're just finishing writing this paper. This is a speck of dust still. This is like 1% of the NIH budget. But it's grown 1,200% in the last 10 years. And it, it's grown, it's, it's continuing to grow. So we're gonna continue to see this kind of research and we need to get ahead of it. So that's what we're trying to do. We um, had focus groups last year at the Primer meeting and four focus groups with people who were IRB administrators, analysts, directors, members, chairs, leadership, Primer board of directors. Um, so we analyzed that data and we found that people were concerned about capacity overload. They couldn't keep up with the volume that they have already. How are they supposed to keep up with this new emerging kind of research? They didn't feel like they had the expertise. They didn't want to be inconsistent. 
So they were worried about that. They don't have the evidence that they need to make decisions and they're not familiar with these technologies and they're concerned that their IT person isn't going to be available every time they need to go and ask a question. So those are problems that we started to ask the questions to other people. We've not only been interviewing and doing focus groups with IRBs, but also with scientists that are using these tools. And so we're asking the question, like, how can we design a system that's responsive to the stakeholders as, as science starts to change and morph? Do we keep the system we have? Do we transition to a new model? And how do we have a conversation about where this is going? So right now, I kind of think about our stakeholders as being the tool makers, but as, as you look at the tool makers, these are the people that make the technologies. They're actually morphing into the researchers. So you can see I have Google and, and Facebook and Apple up there, but now they're just not limited to that one task. They're now getting involved in being a researcher. We've got the human subjects who participate in the studies, and we have IRBs. We also have clinicians, and we also have patients, and we have people. So this is, this is a community of people that we need to be thinking about. So I had proposed that we engage all of these stakeholders in conversations to see how do we intersect this, but I didn't have enough funding to do that. So my stakeholders are IRBs and researchers, and this is a participatory process. So, and I'll go back. So, CORE is Connected and Open Research Ethics. That's what CORE stands for. And the people that we have talked to through focus groups, through interviews for the past year, have told us what they wanted, and we've started to build it. So what we have now is a network of people who represent the stakeholders. Almost 200 people now, and we have not really started to advertise. So the only reason I'm talking to you about it is that we're now ready for you to come join this community and help become active participants in moving it forward. Up until this point, we've been building and beta testing, testing and reiterating, and now we think we've got a pretty good program in place. We also have a Q&A forum, and I was talking to Elisa Hurley, who's the executive director of Primer, who's also on our steering committee. She said, how is this different than the IRB forum? I said, that's a great question. First of all, we only are focusing on missed technologies, mobile imaging, pervasive sensing, social media, and location tracking, and we're not here just for the IRB people. We're here for all stakeholders to come together so that we can answer questions that we don't know the answers to yet. So if you're doing a study and you don't really know how to handle the data, I would like a privacy person or a security person to come in and say, you need to be thinking of these things. So that's the community that we're building. If we have a researcher who's used location tracking and has language that they've used that has been a really useful tool in their consent form, people get what they're explaining, they share that information in the resource library. Our resource library now has protocol language that has intellectual property redacted, but it has protocol language talking about risks, talking about data management, we have con consent language, all of these entries are tagged so that you can easily find what you're looking for. Um, but the Q&A forum is a place where you can go ask questions. And one of the things Elizabeth Buchanan told me when she was trying to create something like this for internet research is she said the biggest mistake was that we didn't create the option to be anonymous. And so if you have questions and you're not confident about having your name out there, you click I want to be anonymous. That way you can put out, you can ask questions and not feel like you're embarrassing your institution or yourself. You just show up and ask questions. And, and I would have shown you these, but I'm not sure. I, I don't know if I could have linked to this because I think their Wi-Fi might not be working here. So this is what the network looks like. This is 50% researchers at this point in time, 35% IRB people, and then we have people who identify as ethical, social, legal, LC people. We have people who are identifying as regulators, um, patients. We have 
yeah, it's it's like a really cool group of people that are now, and I don't know a lot of them, which is even more fun because I thought I'm the, on the bandwagon going out to get people to show up, and now I'm getting people. To, I've got people in the UK, in Australia, in Canada. So this is becoming a global network, and I would really like you to show up and be a part of it. So take a picture of this, and I have cards for you for later. But this tells you how you can sign up for the network, what's on the platform. It has information about if you want to tweet about whether you like it or not. Um, all of that is there for you. And OK, I just heard that. Oh, no. I didn't get my camera out in time. <laughs> um, and again, I do have cards, and I'll I'll be here. So one of the things we want to do, though, is we need to bring participants into the conversation. We need to get feedback from participants if this, you know, does the consent language, is it meaningful to you? Do you like what it's saying? Do you get it? So we need to start engaging participants in the process of our conversation. So I'm going to bridge the core project that I've just explained and, and why we did what we did and where we are with a program that I've been working on for gosh, close to 15 years called Building Research Integrity and Capacity. So this is a program about community engagement and community education. And I want you to think in your mind, just reflect on what does a researcher look like to you? Who are the PIs that you work with? Well, if you're working in biomedical science, you probably don't think of these bench scientists, but most people think of somebody working in a lab when they think about what is a researcher. These actually happen to be my colleagues over at UC San Diego. They're real people. And these are the researchers that I work with in San Diego. And they're community health workers. In San Diego, they go by Promotora. And <clears throat> About two, in, in 2000, when the federal government came out with requirements for training key personnel in human research protections, we did a program for our graduate students and we did it for our faculty and we really tailored it to behavioral and social sciences because that's what we did. And the investigators in public health came up to me and they said, but you know, so many of our researchers are monolingual Spanish speakers who have about an eighth grade education and whatever you create for graduate students and faculty is going to be lost on this group even if you translate it. So we were fortunate to be able to get funding from the National Institutes of Health, um, Heart, Lung and Blood, to create a program that was tailored for community health workers. And just for some background about who these people are, how many of you have in here have heard of community health workers? Oh, awesome. So they're called different things depending on where you are in the country, where you are globally. There's, they go by close to 150 names that I've seen through the World Health Organization who's published papers on, on the role of community health workers in global health. But in the US, it is becoming a very important way for research to happen in communities. And so they go by these different names. Patient Navigator is really popular in San Diego. Um, Research Promotora, Community Health Advisor, Outreach Educators. And the American Public Health Association has a dedicated section for community health workers. Many states are starting to certify them. And they can actually be paid through the Affordable Care Act now which is creating some tensions within the community because many of them don't have a, a bachelor's degree and they don't do it because of their education, they do it because of their love for the community. And so they have become such an important part of reaching hard to reach populations where health disparities are most prevalent that they are now helping to shape the design of studies, especially with community-based participatory research momentum gaining steam and community-engaged research, is that they, do, they help people who are researchers 
they tell them, we have a problem with asthma. Our kids are getting sick. Why is that? Well, it happens to be they live near a freeway, actually under a freeway. So the researchers work with them on how do we study this and then figure out how to reduce the incidence of, of asthma in this population. So they co-design the research, they implement the research, they disseminate results, and then they apply these findings in practice. What they have in common is that they don't have any formal research training, and when we got involved with Promotoras, what we learned is because they don't know what research is, they do things that compromise the protocol inadvertently. They may be asked to deliver a dose of something. The dose could be a cooking class. The dose could be an exercise intervention. And they don't realize that they're part of a study because the PIs don't think they need to know. One of our focus groups, we learned that PI meant practically invisible. <laughs> so it's kind of telling you there's a disconnect on the team, right? So we've been focusing a lot of our efforts on training promotoras, but I'm now moving over to training PIs. Because if they don't know what their people know and don't know, what's the quality of the data, right? We're making a lot of important decisions about public health based on data that may be compromised because the promotora didn't get training that they needed. And it's not malicious research misconduct. It's inadvertently changing a protocol because they think what they're doing is going to better serve their community. And Paul Applebaum looked at this in the clinical setting. He found the same thing that clinical nurses did in clinical trial protocols. When they saw their patient's care was potentially compromised, they would change up the protocol. But in this case, you know, the promotors really didn't know that they were part of a research study, and sometimes they can't really tell the difference between service delivery and research activity because the, the intervention looks like education, right? So recently, the C3 report came out, and it's the first report on community health workers that's been published since 1998. And for the first time, it said that the community health workers need to have training in research methods how to, how to design and implement program evaluation. And there's a lot of movement on how to create professional training for community health workers. Most of the training up until this point has been very disease specific. Okay, we're hiring you or you're volunteering to deliver an intervention that focuses on cardiovascular disease. Here's what that is, here's what you're doing, here's, so very contained. But now they're saying they're involved in research. And this is not new. Promotors have been involved in research for 30 years. It's just now that they're being recognized as an important part of that team that needs training. And I'm pretty happy about that because we're way ahead in that we've created the curriculum that would meet that need. So we um, had gotten funding from the Office of Research Integrity. So first funding was National Institutes of Health. We start doing focus groups with PIs, project managers, and promotoras to find out what do you need to know about human research protections in order to do your job. So we found out what is it they're doing, how they're doing it, where they're doing it, and that's when we found out that they didn't know what research was. So it's really hard to build a foundation about human research protections when they don't know what research is. So we kind of go back to the drawing board and think we have to teach them what research is. How are we going to do that? So we asked the Office of Research Integrity, can you give us some funding so we can build these other modules? And I can tell you that's one of the hardest jobs I've ever done is create a research methods course for somebody that we're targeting like a sixth to eighth grade level. Um, you know, typically when you're in college, you go through an entire semester in research methods, and you know that that's probably one of the more challenging courses. But we were able to to get this, you know, to a point where we're talking about what is research, what is health services, what's a research design, what is a variable. What are these things? I mean, so we have five modules in our amazing curriculum that focuses on building that foundation. And then we have modules on the rest of it. But 
the point of this is, is I, I had Office of Research Integrity money, I built these modules, we had NIH money, we built these modules, and they were existing in two different places and not very visible. And so I went back to the Office of Research Integrity a couple years ago and I said, we have these really amazing programs that are over here and over here because of different funding sources. I need to bring them together and we need to evaluate them. So I went back out to the, to the researchers and I said, are your promotors still doing this kind of work or are they doing something different? How should we assess their research capacity? And then we wanted to measure whether or not our BRIC program worked in increasing their knowledge about research. So this is what it looks like. And I brought a copy in case anybody wants to see. This is a really cool book. It has pretty pages. And you can, you know, it's actually something that you can study on your own, or you can do it in a group, or we come train you, or we come train them. So there's a lot of ways that you can get access to this. So it's on our website. These are the modules that I was just mentioning. So an introduction, what is research, what is research design, what are the elements of research, how do you collect information, how do you handle information, what is human research ethics? How do we think about risks and benefits? What does that mean to think about the magnitude and probability of harm? We break this down into really accessible chunks that are translated in Spanish and English. So we now have Spanish and English, and I was fortunate enough to be on a Fogarty Award to, to Jordan, and now we have it in Arabic. And pretty soon we're going to have it in Portuguese. And again, this is not something that we're doing to compete in any way with CITI. We're, we're really focusing on a completely different member of the research team. And Paul Braunschweiger and I have talked already about how can we work together to make sure that training that is for non-researchers is available because they're an important part of the team. And if you put one of our promotoras behind a computer to go through the city program, they are demoralized. They are embarrassed. They don't understand it. It doesn't map to what they're doing. Then the research manager has to explain what this means. So it's taking two people's time to go through something that isn't really helping. And so we're really focusing on an entirely different demographic who's doing a different kind of job in the research infrastructure. This is just an example of a Spanish slide, because we have this in slides that are narrated, audio narration. We're building our web-based access. We, like I said, have it in hard copy. But this is how a demonstration of what random assignment is. And that concept is not really easy for people to get. The, you know, the whole concept of randomization is, is a challenge. So when we were teaching this course over the summer last year, it turned out that the idea of, of going through across the border, across the Mexican border into California, some people get pulled over to secondary for inspection. They thought of that as being random. So when they gave us an example of what random meant, now we can use something that, that's meaningful to them when it, trying to explain what this concept is. So this is just an example of how we try to use really nice visuals combined with graphics to demonstrate a point. And this is, this is just a, we, we created an instrument that to measure their research capacity, knowledge, and skills. We had a self-assessment. We also had multiple choice questions that were critical thinking about. And the questions that we created mapped to our learning objectives for each module. And we typically had three items for each learning objective. I learned later after we started doing this that when you create an assessment an educational program assessment, it typically takes $5,000 per item to do it right. But we didn't have that many dollars per item. But I think we did a really nice job of creating multiple choice questions. And so we did a pre and a post. So we did a lot of pilot testing of this, of this instrument before we administered it. 
And we did a pre-post and we found out that even though we randomly assigned people to the control group or to our experimental group, the control group ended up having more research knowledge than our experimental group at the get-go. But after the course, our, our BRIC students scored five more questions correctly than the, ex than the control group. So we're still kind of teasing that out to find out exactly what that means. So we're still working on our data for this. Um, but the assessment, like I said, it, it's looking at research competencies, their knowledge, and we use com community examples that are contextualized. And we've tested this now, not only with Latinos, but with Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, and with, um, a, gosh, a group of 250 California folks that were hired to help implement a $50 million randomized controlled trial with special needs youth. So the program hired 250 people that had no research background to implement a program. And so we, got, we had the opportunity to train a lot of different people. And this is all we do when we, when we adapt our curriculum is we just use examples and scenarios that, that resonate with that group's culture, their experiences. So these are some of the early adopters that we've um, engaged in working with the BRIC program. So Department of Rehabilitation, again, that's the $50 million one in California, but it's about $265 million across the U.S., so they have many different states involved in this. The study, and again, it's special needs youth with the idea that if they have a certain type of intervention, they may become independent, autonomous, employed people. So the U54 is Moore's Cancer Center, and they have implemented our program with um, patient navigators. And we have a NCI study that is focusing on Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. We've implemented the program on an NCI study that was with the Somali refugees in City Heights. Um, over the summer, a colleague of mine implemented our program with Promotoras that he hired in Ecuador to study the effects of pesticide exposure on adolescent and child development. And a recent colleague who is doing a global study to eradicate kidney disease is using our program right now in four different countries. So we're starting to gain some ground and we couldn't do it without an awful lot of people. And I'm sorry for the small letters up here, but this has really taken a lot of time and effort to do well and to do it right. And we've engaged the community at every step of the way. And the promotoras have been instrumental in creating the documents and testing them and telling us what graphics work and what graphics don't work and what words mean something different than what we thought they meant. And we have a bicultural, bilingual team. So this, um, this manual and this program have been vetted by the very best. We had subject matter experts who are experts in human research protections reviewing it. We had experts in research methods reviewing it. So we had content experts as well as people who understood the culture and the language. So we've been blessed by having a lot of folks really supporting what we're doing. And here is the contact information for the BRIC project in case you want to take a look at that and look us up online. Um, again, the curriculum is going to be available for download. Uh, we're trying to figure out a model to make it sustainable because we need to have income in order to continue to develop it. I'd love to be able to give it away, but the book I just showed you here, it costs a lot to print. So we need to figure out how to make it something, you know, we don't expect a promotor to buy it because they don't have the money. If we can get PIs to start putting this in their grant as a line item, as a training uh, cost, then that might be a, a method of doing it. 
And then we're going to be, you know, doing different kinds of road shows where we'll, we'll be part of conferences. So next year, we'll go to the APHA conference and, and do a pre-conference workshop for the community health workers. We're going to partner with Campus Community Partnerships for Health so that we can do that. But this, this curriculum is really focused on community health workers, but what I'd like to say is that it doesn't have to just be community health workers. If we're going to create participants who are partners, this is the kind of curriculum that we need to be able to reach out to people that are not research savvy citizens. So I say next steps, this is a, a mess of new things that we have going on. It's going to take a lot of education. So first, next step is education. It's going to take some money. It's going to take patience. And we need to involve the community in that process. We can't be doing this in our silos anymore. So I'd like to start thinking about democratization of research so that we bring this community together and that we have these conversations together. And as the Precision Medicine Initiative moves forward and begins to recruit a million people I think everybody in this room has a role to play in helping to make sure that we're checking with people who participate in studies to make sure they're on board and understanding what they're doing. So in closing, I just want to say, you know, the more we can do to bridge the gap, I think our core platform is a place where this can start to happen. Because as these studies move forward with a million people, they're going to be utilizing emerging technologies wearable sensors, implantables, all kinds of new things. Research is going to not only happen in people's homes, Walgreens and CVS are going to be the major hubs for where research happens. So um, with that, I would just like to thank you all for listening to me. And I'll be around the rest of the day and, and for most of tomorrow. So. I do hope to talk with you one-on-one, -on -one, and if you have any questions, I think I have a few minutes right now. So thank you.